This is Immersive Talk, the podcast all about the people and technology behind immersive media in the Southwest and beyond. My name is Harrison Wilmot. My guest for Chapter 3 is Don Brown, who, like me, is an immersive fellow with the Southwest Creative Technology Network. Our conversation spanned a number of topics, starting with the very broad question, what is immersive media for you, Don? What is immersive media? To you. To me? Okay. So, I suppose from my... I'm fairly new to the whole immersion thing, really, in regards to what so what other people on the fellowship um, have been much more experienced with it than I have. Um, for me, immersive media has come from, basically, my work on my PhD, which is to do with... Basically, I work with a pair of data gloves that you can use to control music. And so the idea of immersion there is very much a case of physical immersion, like being physically immersed in an instrument. When you've got an instrument made of your hands mm. and you that you physically can't put down, how does that work in creating music? And how does that how does that sort of bodily interaction? So you're trapped in the instrument. You're trapped in the, yeah, as almost you're trapped in the instrument. Uh, <laughs> you're drowning in the instrument. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so for me. My experience of like immersive media is very much about like, immersive instruments and thinking about gestural and bodily interaction within immersive media. Mm. Um, so what gets me really excited about things like VR is almost less about the fact that you've got a headset on your head. It's more about the controls in your hands. It's like what 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 are the possibilities there about making something like gesturally interactive mm. in those mediums. Having control of the, of the space around you rather than a, a controller. Exactly. And, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, so I've been playing, I've been getting into playing some VR games. Um, what have you played recently? I've been playing uh, one of, well, I've been playing all sorts of things, but one of the ones that I've found really enjoyable is um, a game called Budget Cuts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Which is great. I and mean, the, the premise of this game is that you are one of the last remaining human employees in a office building and all of you other colleagues around you are like robots and it's okay. all very cartoony and you overhear this your co- some of your robot colleagues talking about how all of the other humans mm-hmm. in the in this place have gone missing they, they could take them to hr and then they never come back basically you know that, that bit in the matrix where um, neo picks up the phone and it's morpheus it's like, you need to get out of the building you've got the agents on your back and it's yeah. very much like this oh cool you have to physically pick up phones mm. and dial numbers into things and open drawers and pick things out and duck down beneath um, things ah, as, cool. as, the, as the contestants. So six, de- six degrees yeah, of freedom. Exactly. Six dot. Exactly. And for me that felt so much more, it felt very novel and very new compared mm. to like other games where, where the game is about, instead of the game being about being able to press buttons quickly, mm. which is, which can be fun in itself. Reactions. Yeah. It's much reflexes. more, yeah. You have to come up with much more creative solutions and you think, okay, well what is, what is around here? How can I get through this mm. element? Or, you know, maybe I've got a pair of scissors and can I use that to take out the guard and that sort of stuff? And it's, it's yeah, cool. it's really, it's, it's, mm. uh, it's a bit, yeah. it makes you think very differently. Um, like there's another one um, called Blades and Sorcery, which I may have posted I think on I've the. Heard about it. Yeah, yeah, yes, you did. I posted this on the Slack and it's, yeah. The one which is like super, you can attack Horrifically yeah. violent. Yes. Horrifically, horrifically violent games, game. Yeah. And it induces the worst motion sickness. It breaks all of the rules around stopping people being motion sick while playing uh-huh. playing these games. Um, but there is something because when you're playing like a combat game like Dark Souls or some some of the something else, you it's basically a rhythm game where you have you know you have to press A at a certain time mm. in order to get the the character to you know stab his spear or swing his sword or whatever. Mm. But because you're physically holding the sword, you have to think, okay, I'm going to hit this guy in the head with a sword. And you, you literally start thinking like this, and you, you you know, when you first start doing, you're just swinging away like you would in a video game. Yeah. But you soon learn that they're just going to be parried, and you have to like wait for gaps in parries. And then you think, right, I'm going to stab them in the groin or whatever. And it's and you think to yourself, yes, that's it's, it's, yeah. When, when the, I think when you're most when you're actually doing those motions, mm. it becomes a lot more real. For yeah. You, doesn't it? Definitely. When you're actually carrying out the actions instead of just pressing a button, mm. you're so, well. I would hope a lot more. <laughs> Le- uh, less desensitized to the actual action mm, yeah so you because you felt like you were being very violent yeah i did and i felt like i was actually murdering someone mm. with a spear or whatever it was and yeah I'm, i maybe that's because it's like a new medium and whether that's been the case when you know when 3d um games came into effect yeah. whether that was whether a similar thing about like it felt much more real mm. um or whether it is 
I, but for me, I think there's something in the, the fact that you're gesturally doing it and there's something mm. about you physically moving your body. So um, you, you don't do think that. people will eventually, like, like kind of the VR literacy mm. will kind of be accepted and people will get more sensitised to actually moving their physical bodies in a space. Yeah. And then that novelty wearing off and then people... Or do you think it would... Do you think it still, like, has a, a potential to be a... A significant aspect mm. of that's a, immersive media. That's a really interesting. That's a really good question because it sort of reminds me about Nintendo Wii's. Ah, and yeah. Nintendo Wii, and you, if you remember, in back in two thousand and eight when it came out, and all of the kind of promotional footage of like the Wii tennis and stuff, people were doing proper big tennis gestures, and it looked like they were playing tennis in the living room. Mm. But over time, people started cheating the system. Exactly, yeah. and and you you end up having someone sat on the sofa flicking their wrist to play it. Um, and I think something in there is there's something about so I've been thinking a lot about this idea of efficiency in movement mm. Um, mm. which is which is, I've been talking to um, Ben about one mm. of our other colleagues on the yes Ben the Dunks yes. yes and he's a he's a, he's a dancer and he teaches mm. dance and he's been thinking about he talks about like I mean I know nothing about dance so he's like yeah this is like the, the 101 about dance about Ooh. efficiency <laughs> in movement. and I was like oh well, there we go we got the knowledge across but about how being good at dance is essentially having very efficient movements and very smooth and very graceful movements. Um, and there's something about that, I think, in that video game as well. Like, if you practice with the Wii Remote, you, you learn that you, your motion doesn't need to be as big and as drastic. You learn, because of the, the sensor in the system, it's just an accelerometer, it's yeah. just a peak of the accelerometer. And you learn that, okay, well, this motion, this large motion, is yeah. the same as this small flick. And you can get a lot more energy in a small flick. So you kind of learn the parameters that exist within the gestural controller mm. and you just attenuate to that. But with VR, yeah. it's slightly different because you actually have three... three. It is actually mapped to your body. Exactly. So your the limitations are only... The, the, the extent of the... The cheating is yeah. that you can only you can only the extent of your physical limitations. Exactly, yeah. You have to physically move yeah. from here to here. You know, that's got that 360, um, six degrees of freedom thing mm. going on. Um, so I think there is more potential for it to be a for that for that kind of gestural nature of it mm. to still be a thing later down the line mm. um, and I, I hope it is because that's, that's what yeah. excites me about it so I think maybe people won't get desensitised to it mm. people will just get a lot better at spatial awareness yeah. and then being more physical mm. in, in a virtual environment yeah yeah, and I, I hope that that then becomes like the norm of games. Yeah. And, and what makes a new game or a new piece of immersive media, interactive media, interesting mm. is like, okay, well, how is it going to make me, what am I going to have to do here and the interesting things like that. games mm. do you, what do you think about kind of non-entertainment how immersive media and like spatialization and physical in virtual will affect non-entertainment stuff non-entertainment so things like um training stuff Tra training yeah. like non-fiction um mm. behavioral uh, adaptation or, or behavior change experiences yeah i don't know i don't um, i'm not sure it's i feel i suppose you've got that so if you're talking about, say, a training thing, and if it's to do with motion particularly, so if you've got, like, um, if you're training a surgeon, say, in a virtual environment, mm. um, it's going to definitely rely on how precise and how, how closely that maps to the real-world mm. scenario. Because, um, for instance, if you had a, you know, like the motion controllers, you don't have that, you're not going to have those in a surgery. No, so no. You, it's... So then you, you're looking at freehand stuff. And you can do freehand stuff. So with Elite Motions and there's things coming in with, um, I think, the Windows props that are looking at this. or uh, I know the Vive mm. Pro yeah. um, is, is like a firmware update because they've got cameras in the front mm. pairs, yeah. which allows you to, it maps to your hands yeah, pretty the, precisely. Yeah. And the Microsoft HoloLens, mm. you can do gestures and things, which yeah. I experienced today for the first time. Yeah. Very fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the technology is pretty much on the doorstep now it's yeah. about to be mm. real and it's how how much how um, accurate that hand tracking is mm. but then you've also got to think about that haptic feedback exactly as well yeah. vibrations and all that exactly. and like resistances and things mm. so I was thinking about how do you um, simulate the kind of a, a skin type texture or kind of organs within for for surgeons or something yeah. like that and I was thinking maybe mm. you could have some kind of 
um, mesh, mm. which your your the your kind of virtual physical scalpels are attached to, which yeah. kind of then tighten or loosen depending on in, in like these four, I don't know, six degrees of it's like a uh, like a controllable uh, yeah. simulated mesh membrane, membrane thing. thing. That yeah. sounds quite cool. Yeah, which I think could be quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, it makes me it, it, your it reminds it makes me think of like can we use the VR tech to like to augment the existing stuff. So, you, for instance, the yes. CPR dolls, you know, yes. is there, there a way there's, of, yeah. Um, there's a guy called Professor Robert Stone in the University of Birmingham. Okay. I'm working with you know, Queen Elizabeth's Hospital in Birmingham. Yeah. And, or actually he's working with the military. <laughs> he's, doing, <laughs> he's doing some cool stuff with um, a physical body, a physical simulation, simulated man who's been like painted and he's like feels like an actual guy. And his like legs been blown off, and right. you can actually see that. And it uses it uses like pass through heads up display, yeah. And it's kind of like blue screen the space you're in, and mm. then so it kind of loads in this virtual environment of a moving chinook, yeah. And then you actually see the model in front of you, mm. and then you're 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 a medic and you're kind of treating this guy, yeah. In this kind of environment, which is like super loud and noisy in the back of a chinook, and you can you're mm. then trying to introduce like smells like aviation fuel and stuff in yeah. that. Just super interesting, like the combined realities, um, and kind of trying to address the problem of um, needing a kind of physical um, anchor yeah. in, in a virtual environment to, yeah. to train people properly. Yeah, yeah, and it's how effective is that training compared to a real world situ situation? Because mm. I suppose you're always conscious in your head, like you're always conscious that you're wearing a thing, and you're conscious that it is a simulation. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, how does, is it going to be something that people just get used to? Because the, the first thing you're like, wow, this is so realistic. Mm. You know, but then you think, oh, you, you, you notice the, the subtle differences between, well, you know, it's, you know yeah. I'm not feeling the G-forces or something. And there's always going to be elements of sensory stuff that's yeah. not going to be in there. I was thinking like that because there's a sense of that in that there's a sense of um, getting used to the immersive experience mm. while you're in it. Yeah. There, where... You, you kind of need like almost like a lobby space before the experience to kind of go, oh, so this is immersion and there's this does here and this, and I, get, I need to get used to the experience before actually being dropped into the training situation. Mm. So you're not taken away from the training situation by just kind of looking around and going, oh, this is fun. <laughs> <laughs> We've been talking about a lot in the, the fellowship about the onboarding and offboarding. Yeah. Ramp in the slope. Ramp in the slope. Ramp in yes. the slope. Yeah. No. It's. Uh, yeah. It's. It's definitely. A, it's an interesting application. Mm. Um, and definitely think that that has that commercial um, potential. I suppose that's the big question with VR stuff now. Is is it going to be something that I think about? Is like, is it going to be a? Is it going to take off from now, or is it mm. going to be a flop? You know. Isn't it? I reckon uh, people will keep saying, is it dead? Is right. VR dead? Yeah, yeah. But, and I know there's people in the industry who are annoyed at have everyone getting asked that question mm. all the time. Yeah. And I think that it's certainly going slower than what everyone, all the kind of the big corporate people are like kind of hyping it. Yeah. Because they want to make money as fast as possible. Yeah. Whereas I think it needs more development and knowledge sharing mm. to, to actually be useful in the world. Yeah. I think AR... Mm. augmented reality and like through phones particularly mm. i think is gonna kick off way more and yeah. it already has kicked off way more i think into yeah. the mainstream i you think there's something about the kind of how vr was initially marketed as mm. it being a new the you know ultimate a, gaming experience yeah like and about it being you are put into a new reality and it's like mm. well you're not really you've got you just got like a 360 display yeah, it's just and some hand controllers yeah at first yeah. it was just like a visual mm. kind of a it limited your vision yeah. and um, limited your other senses as yeah. well. So it's not, yeah. it's, that's what I found about virtual reality. It's not reality. It's mm. uh, an immersive experience yeah. where you'll, if anything, you've had senses taken away. Yeah. So you're m more in a, a flow state yeah. in that particular experience rather than an entire alternate reality. Yeah. And I think that's, that's fine. I think mm. you can get a lot of really cool stuff within that space. I think just the fact that it is not it is not a a new reality mm. that kind of a lot of people when they first try it, they they may be let down by that yeah um, yeah but exactly. I think there's as a interaction medium um, there's a lot of potential still mm. in it 
Um, that yeah, and I think we're still. I think we're also at the early days of like VR content um, and decent stuff. So if so, for in my experience in like the music stuff, something I've been looking at quite a bit uh, with my fellowship project. Mm. Do you want to explain a little bit about your fellowship project? Yeah. So um, I when I decided to do the well when I got given the, the fellowship. Um, one thing I wanted to keep in mind was I wanted to make something. I wanted to kind of be very hands-on and build something that I could then, cool. you know, and then work Script that way. Wise. Yeah, I just did a lot of thinking. <laughs> 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 which is which is great, and I think you um, that's one way of doing it. But I've d- I did a lot of that sort of stuff in my PhD. It's that sort mm. of sitting down and thinking for a lot. And I thought yeah. it'd be great to have this opportunity to kind of think while doing. Yeah. Um, and so I've basically been building a, a VR music instrument or VR music experience. Not quite sure which, whether it's an instrument or an experience or something, but... It's like, because you, you're, you're still kind of creating yeah. the, the, the means to make, a, make sounds. So you're creating yeah. in your own instrument. Mm, exactly. So it's called, at the moment, it's called Noisy Shapes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> cool. uh, yeah, which, uh, which a friend of mine, Alex Jones, who does VR work with... The University of Bristol. I was explaining to him, and he said, "Oh, so it's, it's kind of like noisy shapes." I was like, "Great, you've just yeah. got a name for yeah. it. Fantastic!" Um, so, in, in in this in this kind of um, experience, you you can you can draw these lines in the air, um, and then those lines and these what well, I call them strings, or these these strings that then get imbued with musical properties mm. depending on say its length. So, the length of the string, like in real life, the longer the string, the lower yeah. the pitch. But then the things you can do in you know in VR that you can't do in real life, like the string can be all twisty and curled up. And that can have different, like a different tonal yeah. property, perhaps. Um, now, have you managed to put that into the your your working prototype yet? Your your kind of your working because mm. um, when when I first experienced it, yeah. it was just the length of the lines which yeah. did stuff. Mm. But you're saying the kind of the the kind of the straightness or the yeah. kind of the vigorous vigorousness of the yeah. the curly line yeah. makes an effect on it as well. De- yes, yeah, and that's been that's kind of been. I've, I've implemented the kind of Unreal Engine side of things. I just need to go into the audio side of things and, ah, yes, and okay. do yes. the do that yeah, side yeah. of stuff. Um, but yeah, so because it's the sort of it kind of ties back to because of, of gesture essentially. Mm. Because when you when you draw this nice long flowing line, you've got this nice. It's almost the um, yes, like the pleasant. metaphor of that movement. Yes. When you yeah. when you've got like a, when you're sort of having to do a squiggle almost, yeah. and you're squiggling the air. It's quite like a rough movement and quite intense and so how does that reflect how does that that gesture that you've drawn and is how is it reflected sonically it's really interesting that you're yeah. create you're literally creating a metaphor for sound yeah in front of you mm. yeah that's really cool yeah um and something that i something that i wanted to keep in mind the whole time was this idea about making it as gestural as possible mm. um so the the muse so when you're creating sound objects you do that gesturally and when you play them you do that gesturally so you have to, you have to strum them and pluck yes. them and the velocity at which you strum them you know, affects how loud the sound is, etc. Because um, I've seen other music um, VR apps, which are essentially just digital audio workstations like Logic or yes. Ableton, but just in 3D space. Yeah. And you've got a button here yeah. and you've got a slider here. And it's a bit like, so you've taken these 2D interfaces of a button or even mm. 1D interface of a button and a slider yeah. and you put them in this 3D space and it, it just feels like a, a wasted opportunity. Mm. Like, And you've got like Beat Saber, which has mm. like... A four-dimensional reality where yeah. it's, they are coming at you in time. Yeah, and there's something gestural in Beat Saber, so you have to do them at different angles yeah. and different speeds and stuff, and you have to move out the way of objects, and yeah, there's a... It's, there's not, it's not creation, actually, is it? It's, it's reacting yeah. to a, a sound. Yeah. Have you put your plinky plonky noisy noisy shapes, noisy shapes. with uh, any kids? Have you tried it with kids? No, I haven't. So I've done a few um, kind of sharing with with the with the public i'm doing one tomorrow but i haven't had a chance to put it in front of like a particular demographic it's mm. just been kind of a bit general yeah it's been mainly at, at events and things and going yeah keep, stick this on your head and play around and because yeah. i i was wondering whether you had any like feedback on the intuitiveness of right it, yeah and whether any feedback uh, kind of influenced how you have have you had a chance to kind of <laughs> use feedback to influence how you've been creating it? Yeah, I think one of, interestingly, I think the feedback is feedback almost, like having that um, that element of tactile feedback mm. of when, you, when you're when you playing the strings or when, you, when you're interacting with them, um, you have that you have that thing visually, but then having that, just a little bu- little buzzes in the controllers just to kind of reinforce yeah. the stuff I found. I, I put that in and it really does make a big difference. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's a good show. Yeah. So I think that for making it intuitive people pick up on it people pick up on new interaction methods fairly quickly as mm. long as 
the feedback is appropriate. Like for in the early prototype, you had to kind of make a gesture and then the string would appear where your gesture was. And so yes. there was no kind of feedback as you were gesturing as to what the string would be like. Mm. But now I've implemented that literally the string falls out of your controller. So as cool. you immediately start drawing it, the string will immediately appear. It's kind of like poops out. Yeah, it kind of like poops <laughs> out. It poop, you have, the string poops out yeah. of the controller. I mean, you cool. will be using that terminology now. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yes. Um, and it makes it much more intuitive and yeah. understandable because you're like, oh, it's that, that feedback is immediate. The, the thing that you've found well, into the mm. virtual environment is immediately you know, evident as to what you've done. And do you think you... you because we talked about before about having gest- gestures like actual kind of mapped to ha- fingers instead of controllers. Mm, yeah. Do you think you can, would you implement that later on down the line and have it so you can then re-manipulate the strings? Yeah, so that's, this is this is one of the kind of like the many potential mm. things to go down. There's a part of me that wants to keep within the, the hardware aspect of just having it as like a, you know, you buy an Oculus Rift and you can plug it in and you can use this. Mm. So, because at the moment you'd have to either use a, a leap motion that could work, or the or the gotcha. or the new Vive yeah. system. So I suppose maybe once those systems become more, because you know VR it, a VR hardware in itself is you know very small Few amount of the public. Yeah, area, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So there's a small enough market as it is, and then yeah. you kind of say, oh, you have to have a freehand method. Mm. Then this makes your kind of market even narrower. But it is something that is kind of is is possible and could make it even, like you say, like, or like I say, even more gestural, like where you have to manipulate it with your fingers and move them about. I think that would be quite a nice, that could be a really nice, nice interaction. Um, yeah. But at the moment it is just with the hands, with the controllers. controllers. Yeah. Cool. Mm. Brilliant. Mm. And you're, you, you spoke to me earlier and you're planning on having like a game hack, hackathon? Yes. Kind of yeah. So um, I've got, I think this is part of the, um, kind of our sharing output mm. um, and kind of being the focus being on okay well how can I share this as much as possible uh, and for me because it's at a stage now where kind of the, the main kind of the ideas there are down there and it's like okay well like you know I get that but it's you know it's in the default Unreal Engine nice blue sky and the lines that yes. you draw are bright white and then they go bright yeah. green when you play them <laughs> <laughs> so you need some like pizzazz or some yeah there could um, be skins exactly <laughs> um and i think well could i i mean i'm fairly new to dis- design unreal engine mm. and designing 3d experiences mm. so the visual stuff is kind of like something that i could do but yeah what's the most what's the most valuable thing i can do with yeah. this it's like okay well i can share it with other people and have a hack day where so someone who comes along might be a visual designer for yeah. games or whatever and they can build a nice environment in a day and then they go okay here's you know here's what i've done and then someone else might go okay well maybe you want to use okay maybe instead of drawing strings you want to do drums or something mm. and um, having that having this day where I can kind of share my idea and make the software completely open source as well mm. uh, so that you know if you if you weren't like the day you could still da- you know download it and, and have a go anyway um, of taking it it's like making it as a start point just to explore this conversation of how can we make immersive musical experiences and so it may be the case where someone comes on and go oh this idea, this idea is rubbish but I'm gonna make something else musical yeah. and kind of having that opportunity to you know, build the network um, of creatives and to and to kind yeah, of spark conversation kind of about creative it. common space, uh, yeah. like appropriation and things, yeah. and just a kind of a, a, a mess of creativity to just kind of exactly yeah. have a big splurge of ideas. I yeah. think, and I think that would be a really kind of nice way of yeah of, of kind of sharing it as well yeah. with, with with everyone. things just came out of my thought mm. deep thinking process like the very end of the fellowship mm. uh, deep thinking phase was in response to thinking about transparency in um, behavior change experiences mm. where cons- con- conversationalists conserva- conservationists <laughs> and like people who wanted to get ideas across to other people who, who might have implicit biases and things like that mm were worrying about or kind of thinking about the best way to measure how somebody's mind has been changed Mm. and there i was gleaning kind of um information from them about some like sly ways which scientists psychologists use to measure people's minds getting changed yeah and then i was thinking personally if 
how would I feel about an experience afterwards mm. if I'd known that the creator of that experience had made it specifically to change my mind? Mm. I was like thinking, well, how would I feel about that? And I feel that I would want some kind of heads up at right. the beginning, before the experience, to go, hey, hang on, this content, this immersive media is in some way intended to change your mind. Mm. Um, and I was thinking, how could we make that apparent? And I, I came up with the idea of having some kind of classification scale right. or content warning, which doesn't give away too much, but just says, just kind of gives an indication of the intensity or mm. the intent of uh, how much this experience has been designed to change my mind. Yeah. Like what, not necessarily like what kind of stuff it was used, like techniques and design was used to change my mind, but mm. the intensity of intent behind yeah. how somebody wanted to shift my perspective. Yeah. At first I created like kind of a, a kind of graph um, which had like arousal at the bottom and then intent on the kind of the Y axis and then made like a bell curve of like the ideal space um and then looking it down the line i realized that actually i don't understand how graphs work <laughs> it just didn't make any sense um so the one i showed you is complete utter bollocks okay. in terms of like statistics and graph making and things um so i've settled on a kind of risk assessment type thing where it's um a, a numbers at the bottom mm. in terms of the level of arousal you want and numbers going up terms of the level of intent you want and mm. then you kind of times them yeah um in the in the graph space yeah and then you, so the, the more intent you have and the more else you have then you've got like a really high number which is like super like a, a behavior change intent scale rating of yeah. 99 yeah is like like seriously emotional like manipulation yeah. savage mm. almost torture levels end of clock or orange type right. thing yeah and then down the, the very bottom you've got like kind of passive adverts mm -hmm. like drink water got milk that type <laughs> of thing or the, got milk will probably be a little bit further up because yeah. it's a bit more interesting but yeah mm. all, all immersive media or, or any kind of media which is intended to shift perspective in some way that that i believe there sh not should be but could be mm. a a self classification in terms of the creator yeah puts on their piece of media this bit of media has a behavior change intent scale classification number of mm. whatever medium or high and uh this is indicates that this particular media has some degree of design and techniques used to try and change your perspective mm. and it doesn't need to be like a content warning like this contains blood sex or whatever yeah because that kind of spoils the experience mm. but just by knowing the intensity of like a high or low number, yeah. you can have a heads up of like, oh, so this is 33, which means, oh, it's kind of in the mid range. Mm. I shouldn't be too uncomfortable while watching it, but there is some mm. intent there. See, I'm wondering whether this, whether that scale kind of, by giving people a heads up that this piece of media is designed to change their mind about something, whether that kind of then puts them on guard and then mm. we don't actually change their mind about See, something. See, I was thinking about that as well. Yeah. It's kind of like a quantum thing, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, I, and observing I, it changes it. Yeah, and I suppose like a lot of a lot of media and a lot of films and stuff already do that kind of thing where it you know the point of the film is to is to change your mind about something, is to mm. make you think about something or show you the perspective of someone that you wouldn't have thought of before. Mm. And like a lot of documentaries are mm. all about this. And so that's kind of like the the point of a lot of media is to is to influence people. Mm. I suppose it's this modern thing about when we have this hyper personalized media. Mm. So on, you, you think about Facebook posts telling people that you know the immigrants are going to come and take their jobs and stuff, yeah. but you can target those ones at the particular people that that's going to have the biggest impact on. Yeah. And this kind of nefarious use of personal data to to try and influence people to get the maximum amount of influence on someone mm. um, based on that and, and I think that's that's that thing about that person is then completely una that person is often unaware mm. that their that, that their data is being used to then target them in that way you know if, we, if we're watching um, you know an advert on television and it's of the you know the classic adverts of uh, aid like foreign aid stuff yes. and they have these you know the hungry children exactly yeah. and it's sort of and then you can you know that's obviously designed to be unpleasant to, be unpleasant and yeah. to change your mind to make you empathize with those people mm. Um, 
But we often, you know, like you watch so many times you become desensitised. But when that kind of advertising, not, partic- not, this, not particularly that style, of, that style of advert, but advertising designed to influence you, like you should vote for this political party. Mm. But, but we know that you're more likely to also for this message. Um, there's that less of that, there's, there's, there's no transparency there. Like with mm. the television, it is a, it's a very passively, they're showing you this information and there's, they don't know anything about you and then mm. you can much more easily make that decision and make that judgment about it. Mm. Whereas on the internet, I think there's a lot less digital literacy around that. So maybe something around this kind of level of intent scale would might be quite useful. Or, or making things, I think this idea of transparency of where the media, yeah. like who, who's made the media, who's paid for the media. Yeah. Like what is the, maybe is it, is it about like the political message, you know, in it. Uh, yeah. yeah. I was just thinking perhaps not all media then, or all immersive media, but specifically for kind of, Mm. digital immersive media mm. so particular non-fiction VR yeah. um, cinematic VR and um, 360 video mm. type perspective shifting videos yeah. uh, experiences mm. where the nature, the nature of the medium is quite powerful in kind of being able, able to kind of influence you inceptionize you in mm. some way I think it's important to have uh, the intention of the the creators yeah. be transparent mm. what was I going to say is that because like because of the yeah the, the, the immersive the physical immersion of the media yes. where you know you can't escape yeah and, and it's, sort of thing, it's perhaps, or... because because we didn't really wouldn't wouldn't have needed this until now because mm. a, a lot of media is you can just kind of switch off from it or yeah. kind of look away or do things but because you're completely encased in this media yeah you I feel like you need the heads up particularly if it's if it's like strong stuff is in there to try and change your mind. Like I mm. saw a animal, uh, like a, a slaughterhouse kind of video to try and convince me to be a vegan. Yeah. Um, and I would have liked some heads up that I would, not necessarily a spoiler warning to say, oh, you're going to be near some animals as they lose their lives. Yeah. But just like an, a number which said, this is going to be intense. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just going, okay, so your intention here is mm. to quite significantly try... You, there's a lot of effort behind this to change my mind. Yeah. Just so I can weigh that up mm. in compared to the experience. And another aspect of the classification I would want to include is a kind of a floating point afterwards, mm. which um, is kind of a reaction to the kind of the audience's perspective on how much it changed their mind or how intense it was, com- yeah. their opinion of it. Yeah. So, like, if it was, like, medium intention 21.3, yeah. it's like, uh, <laughs> the audience don't think it's that, yeah. that it's, like, it's like Rotten Tomatoes, you have the, uh, you know... The yes, <laughs> critics, and then the uh, audience, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, and then you weigh the two up and go, okay, so before I go into this, mm. it's, the intention is there, but maybe the, the audience say it's not that, it's mm. not that bad. Yeah, yeah. I suppose you then have the opportunity to go and seek out media that, or maybe you should be... You, people should be encouraged to seek out media that mm. is going to change their mind because mm. you know we have all this talk about people's own media bubbles yeah uh, and it's very easy to exist in your own sphere of influence yeah because um, people there's some, some crazy people out there who are, uh, go out looking for like arguments and looking yeah. out for confrontation yeah. and looking for the challenges like debate me yeah. type people yeah. so if we had like <laughs> some kind of label for all these things you were like oh you can challenge yourself yeah. it's a lot easier yeah, I think I think that would definitely be valid. I think uh, like a lot of the people who go around going debate me just want to kind of show off the fact that they know they yeah. looked at some words on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think there is something that maybe we should be encouraging. We should be encouraging people, you know, like challenge me. Yeah, and, open up themselves. You know, and I think there's definitely a need for it in mm. this anonymous world where we just need people to kind of sit back and arrest themselves and yeah. that, the way they think and the way they perceive yeah. the world and often often by having that by having that challenging you know perspective it makes you you know <laughs> it does make you think about your yeah. own perspective but then you're strength if, if you're still con- you know convicted you still have this conviction behind your beliefs then you're strengthened yeah, then you have yeah. you know instead of yeah like just because it's is, it is not like if like if you're not a vegan and you get to see mm. this film you might think oh well I'm you know it might make you think yeah. a bit like well it did shift yeah. my perspective a little bit yeah. and I'm now I consider myself a flexitarian right. I said so mm. I'm more open to the idea of veganism now because I understand the how cruel some exactly. slaughterhouses can be and yeah. it's, it's um, it was really helpful mm. 
piece of media, yeah. but still, I would have liked a heads up. Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. So we've got a little bit of time left to discuss this beta or this kind of testing test experience mm. uh, called Congregation. Um, would you like to explain a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, so um, Harry and I have just been wondering about Millennium Square with these silver orbs in our hands, yeah, uh, which were sort of screaming at us. Yes, emanating or... good, happy sounds, or then confused, sad sounds, then angry, alarming sounds. Yes. Quite yes. loudly. Yeah, and the, the idea, I think the idea of this experience, it's uh, it's a... Kind of a GPS yeah. guy sound, audio, auditive guiding <laughs> uh, experience where you hold this little egg of sound and as you walk around, it's if you walk in the right direction, it gives you happy noises. Mm. Uh, if you walk in the wrong direction, bad noises. But it's it's GPS controlled and it's as the crow flies. So yeah. you've, kind of, you've kind of got to go in the wrong direction at some point because you've got to avoid buildings and roads and things. Yeah. Um, and you, there's there's a whole group of people, and they all have or we sh we shared one because there's there's not enough orbs at this moment. <laughs> it was quite cool sharing one actually. We felt mm. kind of like parents in like a high school it, yeah. look after the egg type thing. It was. It did, it did feel you did feel quite paternalistic about yeah. this this orb that was like kind of screaming at you and telling you where it wanted to go, and you had to had to guide it towards yeah. its um, its destination. Um, yeah, I think the idea <coughs> that everyone everyone starts at different sections around the city. Um, and as they all meander towards the centre following the noise of this egg, mm. um, they all start meeting up with each yes, other. you end up going... And you end up in a central yeah. location, and then when you reach the central location, the sound changes, and suddenly you're in this collaborative performance almost, yeah. where, you're, where your egg is making a certain yeah. noise, and someone else's egg is doing a different noise, and you... You wander about in that space mm. and interact with them, and it's play interesting around. how we started calling it the egg now because they it was called, they introduced it as spheres, yeah, which is kind of like a, a inanimate object type thing. Yeah, and we were like egg, and that implies life, yes, and, yes, and personality, and, and and we were using voices as well instead of sounds mm. earlier. It's really interesting how that that kind of me media, that kind of um, reactive technology, mm. can anthrop Anthropomorph anthropomor oh, I'm struggling as well. Anthropomorphize? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, these things. It definitely. Uh, yeah, I think just by the fact that it's it, you have that reaction to your you know, it's that like a Tamagotchi. human machine thing where yeah, almost like a Tamagotchi yeah. where it's reacting to you and what you do. And so you're you it does personify in that way. Mm. Um, because you're sort of like you're trying to make it happy and you're very conscious that what you're doing to it is causing it to be distressed. Yeah. Um yeah, and it's uh, it was really interesting. I think we discussed, didn't we, about the um, about the particular sounds it made. Yeah. Uh, so there was so when you're walking in the right direction, it makes this ni nice major harmonic scale yes. and a kind of a nice skippable tune, yeah. rhythmic almost. Mm. But when you kind of turned in the wrong direction, it sort of started. It was like an alarm, like a car alarm. Yeah, but there was like a gradual. There was change a, yeah. to that there yeah. was like a slightly worried sound which was mm. like a, a, a minor yeah. happy rhythm and then mm. there was like a then the other two angry sounds were harder to dif dif differentiate yeah well the, the alarm was considerably was, yeah e very easy to, to distinguish yeah. it as an alarm yeah and we were saying that sort of detracted from the from it because it sort of it, it, it felt like um it was it was something was going wrong mm. like it was the kind of the default noise um, which is it just doesn't know what's going on. Yeah, it turned it back into an object. It turned yes. it away from being a nice yeah. egg that you're, you know, purr, you purring at you to more of a growl or an angry kind of. Yeah, because <sighs> yeah, because <laughs> I think alarms also have this cultural context of, you know, like uh, this established cultural context. And so if you're there are there are ways to make that to make to tell there are auditory ways of telling you you're doing something wrong that don't involve. Alarms. Mm. I think that was. I think that was like the main criticism to it. Mm. Um, I would have. I'd like to see. I think the name. It's called Congregation. Yeah. And when we were doing it, we ended up outside the cathedral, and I was thinking, mm. is there an opportunity to make this more biblical or more, you know, more yeah. religious? And so is it? Maybe you're playing. Maybe it's or playing ritualized. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So then maybe, as you start to kind of 
enter into the congregation mm. end area yeah. if you're in a pr- procession of some kind. Maybe yeah. there's like a, a tune which plays starts at the big at the people closest to the congregation area and yeah. kind of goes ding 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 kind of like yeah or maybe it's singing NGO. hymns or something and everyone's got like a voice yes. in a choir and yeah you, come it, so you start singing a, a hymn or something that could be really uh, interesting. Which be quite cool but. oh man the churches like American churches have come all that bad <laughs> metaphors all around yeah i think it's, it's, it's the question is is that then it does it then become a does it critique the church and then does it become political about the church i suppose mm. or does it you know or is it just basically saying like this is a good thing and we should mm. be more or does it play on that spirituality it's about quite... community and that was that churches yeah. have always established yeah well it could either be supported. community and working together and the groups the whole more than some of its parts mm. Then it could also be like sheep, and like yeah. all following into the the slaughterhouse. Yeah, thing. and is it does it is it like a, a celebration the of? Does it then become like a celebration that religion can do that, mm. or is it basically saying that religion you need religion to do that to be mm. community to be a community to work together? We need a religious context. I think that could ele- be an element of you know something that you might not want to be you know supporting it or something, mm. but. Yeah, interesting thoughts though. Cool, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it reminds me of Duncan's work. Yes, mm. Duncan Speakman. Yeah. Did some really, really cool stuff with audio in A similar spaces, thing, yeah, his reacting. walking yeah. only expansion, only which expansion. was a, a walking thing where you're instructed to walk around the, the centre. And it's much more personally guided. It says things like, find a quiet place. And you yeah. have to think in your head, okay, well, where's quiet around in the city centre? Where's the quiet space? Yeah. And walk there, or... Uh, go go somewhere that's really old and it's mm. um, it was interesting s- contrasting the two and having this being in Duncan's piece being having that agency yes um, compared to this piece where you're you're kind of following it yeah following it rather yeah. than yeah walking around mm. yeah really interesting and, and Duncan's piece has like a reactive to the environment as well yes it kind of fed you back yeah. the, the space mm. which yes. is really cool I think Duncan's use of use of audio was much more nuanced and mm. much more interesting because of that so he had microphones on the he had, you had a pair, a pair of headphones and he had a little box mm. and the headphones were in the box and the, but the headphones had a little, two little microphones and yeah. so you had this sort of binaural thing going on where if a car drove past you you'd hear it in the microphones but it would be processed yeah. and it would be echoed and it would be like a delay and it would yeah. And they would add to the to the soundscape that was playing on your ears, and that was really beautiful. Yeah, there was one point where you were underwater and everything was kind of muted and mm. low pass and everything. Yeah. really really cool. Yeah, and I think there's more scope for that in congregation because congregation mm. definitely felt like there was sort of you know north south you know like there's sort of points in a compass and as you cross one oh, it just it sort was of, very like yeah dunk, dunk, one sound dunk, is one playing the and then that last, this yeah. sound is playing and I think there could be much more scope for having that shift kind of a yeah. more ambig- ambiguity mm. to it. Yeah. Mm. fascinating cool well I think we'll end it there we had a nice I think we took like four topics or something like that yeah it's been great thanks for having me on and oh, uh, be... thank you for coming on yeah a pleasure oh it's always always interesting chatting to you about ah. <laughs> ah. god that's so cute thank you <laughs> this is what I want this is what I want just kind of cool conversations mm. about immersive media with people in the southwest cool that's what I want it's great um and I'll sure to have you on again at some point. Yes. Uh, if, you, yeah. if you're willing. Com- totally. Yeah. Cool. Bro. Sweet. So we'll end it there. And I'll do like a... Goodbye. An ending thing. <laughs> Thanks again to Dom for talking to me. And thank you for listening to us. It's my intention for this podcast to cultivate more thought and activity in the immersive space in the Southwest and beyond. So if you're interested in finding out any more information about the topics we discussed please tweet me at Hasmus or Dom at DomBrown94. The musical intervals in the podcast are currently filled by the track TikTok by Glad Rags, which I found on cchound.com. However, I'm really keen to find a Southwest-based musician or artist to make some more unique sound bits and intros and outros with me for this podcast. So if you're interested in helping me with that, let me know. This podcast was made possible thanks to the Southwest Creative Technology Network and their support to me via the Immersion Fellowship. Special shout out to all the Immersion Fellows and the producers. You guys have been great so far. Thanks again for listening and I really look forward to hearing about what you guys thought of the topics we discussed on this podcast. Cheers.